Amen. Amen. As I talk about kids, my kids um, crack me up, and one of the things my kids know uh, is that I like dad jokes. And dad jokes, if you don't know, are bad jokes. Uh, and somebody messed around and messed up and gave me a dad joke book. Some of y'all are like, who did it? Because you know what's about to happen. We just going to have a little dad joke moment, praise the Lord, because I feel like you need some laughter uh, in your name. Let's just turn to the first page. Where is the best place to work if you have only one leg? IHOP. <laughs> Come on, you know that's pretty good. No disrespect if you only have one leg, but... <laughs> the drummer, he left. <laughs> just go to this one. Why did Dad have to take a break from hauling in shellfish? Because he pulled a muscle. <laughs> nah, y'all ain't like that? Why was the little cookie so sad? Because his dad was a wafer so long. <laughs> y'all don't like wafer? That's pretty. Y'all don't like my book? Okay, I'll just go to mine. Praise the Lord. Why did the woman not let her husband keep his tools in the house? Because they were full of ratchets. <laughs> that was pretty good. You know that was pretty good. I made that up myself. Come, you don't like that? That was pretty good. That was pretty good. You, you know that was pretty good. That was pretty good. All right, I got one more. I got one more. To have you, this is, we're, we're all family, so have you heard a joke about constipation? I'm sorry, that's too, that too rude. Y'all go to the bathroom. Everybody in here go to the bathroom. Hopefully. <laughs> You heard a joke about constipation? Don't worry, it hasn't come out yet. <laughs> that was good. I'll amen myself. Praise the Lord. But here's the reason I tell you a dad joke. is because it was a dad joke that led me to the title of the sermon today. And here's what I mean. Why did the kid get arrested at nap time. Some of you who have kids are thinking, they didn't almost get arrested. I almost got arrested. <laughs> Come on. But why did the kid get arrested at nap? Chris, I heard you laugh too hard. <laughs> you only we gonna go see the people on you. Take your doctoral license all the way away. <laughs> Doctor in prison. No. Why did the kid get arrested at nap time? He was resisting arrest. Okay. Well, here's what happened. I was telling that joke this week. I'll be here all next week and the week after if you want to come back for more jokes. But I was telling that joke, and I was thinking about the fact that that's not really funny, because just like Dr. Withers laughed, I didn't laugh too hard, because my little son, who's four, he been resisting arrest. And he about to get me arrested, because he swears that he doesn't need a nap anymore, because he's grown. Daddy, I am man, I am man, I am man, like you, Daddy, I am man. Bro, you four. And if you don't take a nap by seven, you're, you're about to get slapped. And he thinks he doesn't need something that he actually desperately still needs. And as I was thinking about that joke, the whole, and I was thinking about Brian, the, the, whole, the thought came to me, man, Brian's always resisting arrest. And I thought I was thinking about my son, Brian Jr., the, the second. But the Holy Spirit said to me, no, actually, I, I'm talking about you. That Brian, Pastor Brian, me, just like you, are very often resisting arrest because we think we don't need something that we desperately need. And I want to suggest to you that this morning you could be resisting a rest and not even know it. Well, how am I resisting arrest, Pastor Brian? How are you re resisting arrest? The Holy Spirit said to me, son, you are resisting arrest when you refuse to resist doubt. Let me say it again. You are resisting arrest when you refuse to resist doubt. And here's what happened. Brian, in his non-nap time, 
the other day began to cry and scream and almost get the joy of the Lord as his strength and daddy's belt. Oh, edit that off the tape. I can't go to jail. Come on. You can't say, you can't even look at a kid wrong these days. Just don't leave marks. The devil is a liar. Some of y'all looking at me like, Pastor, you pale. I didn't even know y'all were old like that. I thought y'all, count to 10, Bobby. Count to 10 in the corner. Tie the naughty spot. The naughty spot in my house is this spot right here across the meat in the name of Jesus. You don't go too high. That's the lower back. You don't get on the legs. That bruise is easy. The meat. That's why I was the, the, the Lord. Yeah, come on, praise the Lord. Don't be trying to prejudge me in my discipline strategy, stereotypical. You know you did it. It's okay. But here's the point. He didn't want to go to swim lessons. He's throwing a fit about swim lessons, which daddy works hard to pay for because the way I was taught to swim was <laughs> swim, boy. Move your arms, kick your legs. I still, you still, that's why none of y'all, some of you can't swim, and the ones that can, like me, we don't really have good swimming form. We just, it's kind of like a lateral dog paddle. It's like, that's how you learn how to swim. Anyway, Brian's going to swim lessons because his mom wants him to learn how to swim the way, the right way, and he didn't want to go. He finally admitted to me that he didn't want to go because he doesn't like when he has to float on his back. And I said, why don't you like to float on your back? You can float on your back. He said, Daddy, because she lets me go. Come here for a second, Eric. And I said, son, she may let you go, but her hand is there the whole time. And I said, Brian, do you know why they're teaching you to float on your back? He said, no, no, I just don't like it. I said, they're teaching you to float on your back because when you're too tired to swim, if you needed it in a difficult place, you can flip over and float and rest on your back. And what I realized is what God was saying to me, it didn't really compute at the time, but it makes sense if you see it like Brian. Come here, Eric. Stand right here. You ever done a trust fall? See, what Brian was resisting was he was resisting not just a nap, but he was resisting a float on his back, a rest in the middle of his struggle. But he was resisting it because he hadn't resisted his doubt. Here's what I'm saying. You ever done this exercise? Turn this way so they can see. Eric's pretty strong, so I got to, I mean, I'm a little heavier than you these days. But you ever done this exercise like at a team building thing where you, you, and as much as you're like falling and you, to be honest, you have to fight. I mean, come on, you don't just fall. You be like, uh, you start to size up the person. You start to look at how far back you are. It starts over here. And then you be like, uh, <laughs> falling. And then the, the, little, the little person at the little, the little wilderness place, like, do it again, do it again, do it again. And you're like, you're, then your boss is looking. So you're like, uh, and don't let your boss be back there. You ain't falling for nothing. Cause you'd be like, <laughs> but here's the point. Eric's here to provide me rest, but in order to receive the rest, the floating, I actually have to fight past my fears and my doubts to receive it. Uh, are you, you good? You ready? You sure? Eric, stop doing this. Like, ready's like this. I, you know I done gained some weight. You're my trainer. Don't act like that. No, open your hands, bro. And I don't want to fall too low. Like, put me up, man. Like, Eric. Strong wrist, bro. Like, if you do like this, I'm definitely not falling. All right. We're not. All right. All right. And as difficult as that was for me, Imagine being Brian, just like us in the spirit, where the hand is there, but we don't feel it, and we don't see it. So you have to learn how to rest in your Father's love, even when you can't see or feel His hand. But I can't do that until I first begin to resist 
the temptation to doubt and to fear. So in the book of Acts, chapter 27, book of Acts, chapter 27, where this whole series, When Storms Come, started from, and notice it says when storms come, not if, because storms will come. The Bible says in verse 20, Paul is a prisoner on this ship, and in Acts 27, verse 20 says, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, listen, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you have taken my advice not to, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete, then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. And last night an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. And in Matthew chapter 14 Matthew 14, in verse 25, Jesus has sent the disciples ahead of him on the boat. Let me read verse 24. But the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves. Buffeted by the waves. Some of you are like, what's buffeted? Buffeted is what you can go through when all it seems like all hell breaks loose and it doesn't stop. The tire goes flat. The job starts to talk about layoffs. My wife starts tripping. The kids get sick. Somebody in my family dies. The in-laws move in. This happens. 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 Buffeting is a continual pounding. And some of you have found yourselves in a place where you have been buffeted by life. But during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, listen, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, listen, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. But Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come. He said, then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Resisting arrest. Father, speak powerfully, prophetically, and accurately right now. Remove doubt, remove fear. God, let us resist the enemy, the evil one, the enemy of our souls, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom we may devour. God, in this hour, let no one be devoured. God, speak, bind distractions, help us to focus and be clear, make clear your words. In Jesus' name, we all say together, here's how all this works together. In both passages of Scripture, you see a theme. God says that every matter be established by two or three witnesses. There were these phrases that actually, to me, sound the same. Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid, Jesus says in one storm. Paul in the other storm says, be of, be of good courage, don't, don't be afraid. In storms, one of the things you have to do, we said in this series, number one, is ask for wisdom. Number two, last week we said seek shelter. But number three, you have to take courage. Take courage. What do you mean? Taking courage, taking courage, taking courage. Everybody say, take courage. Be of good courage. Be of good courage. Notice that those are active verbs. It doesn't say feel courage. It doesn't say feel good. It says don't be afraid. Take courage. In other words, what I'm saying is just like in the intro, if you're going to take courage, you're going to have to take it. it means you're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to actually fight for your courage. You're going to have to go get it. That if you're waiting in a storm to feel courage, to feel faith, the storm actually will rob you of your feeling that you're looking for, and you won't have any courage, you won't have any faith. The storm will fill you with wind and waves where you're filled with doubt and fear. You're going to have to take, you're going to have to go take that courage. And some of us have been waiting on God to just give us courage. 
But Jesus didn't just give them courage. He told them to take courage, which means if I'm going to take courage, I'm going to have to resist doubt. But like I said, if I don't resist doubt, I won't rest in love. Here's my point. When Eric caught me, after he caught me, there was courage that I had to fall again. But in the spirit realm, you have to have courage by resisting the doubt before you even feel him there. Because we walk by faith and not by sight. Here's what I'm saying. Brian had to take courage. He had to resist the doubt that he would drown so that he could actually feel himself float. And it's only until he resists the doubt that he can rest on his back. And even if he begins to sink, that he would know his teacher was there. What I'm saying is if you can't take courage, if you don't resist doubt. And some of you have been resisting arrest because you've been, you've been failing to resist doubt. In the storm, one of the main things the devil wants to make you do is doubt. And here's why I'm saying what I'm saying, and it, it, I'm not trying to make it catchy, cute words. I'm trying to help you understand two very, very working together points. Is that in the midst of a storm, what God is saying is that you can actually have rest. One of the things we read last week is that Jesus modeled resting in his father's arms by sleeping on a cushion in the middle of the storm, which means there's rest in the storm. And here, they didn't believe there was rest in the storm because they didn't see Jesus doing the same thing. Paul says the men haven't eaten for 14 days. They, they haven't even slept. That what he's saying is that, guys, you can have rest in this storm, but only if you resist the fear and the doubt. And when I'm resisting fear and doubt, I'm taking courage. And some of us have been resisting the rest that God is trying to give you. You think the storm is trying to overwhelm you and overtake you, and you are at a point where you're thinking about giving up, throwing in the towel, just forget it. But actually, God is saying, there's rest for you. There's rest for you if you can just resist the doubt that's coming to you. So take courage. Take courage. Take courage. It is I. Pastor, well, if I'm going to resist this doubt, what, what am I really resisting to take courage? Well, when you face a storm, what you're resisting is you're resisting a couple of things. And I already said the main one, and they're all connected, but you're resisting by taking courage. And if I'm going to rest in his love, I have to resist, number one, doubt. Pastor, you said that. I know, but it needs to be said again. Because doubt doesn't just come in one moment. Doubt comes as darts. The Bible says you, that you should take the shield of faith by which you ex ex extinguish the fiery darts of the evil one. Do you understand the devil doesn't just send one moment? He sends constant darts. Boom, 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 boom. And they're not just any darts, they're fiery darts. Which means if you let the fiery dart land, it will catch fire to the thing around it which means this will catch fire. And, and what happens is if you don't resist the doubt that says, God's not really there, right? He, uh, maybe God doesn't hear you when you pray. That sets the fire my prayer life, which sets the fire my devotional life, which sets the fire my attitude, which sets the fire my marriage. And before long, not only am I in a storm, but I'm in a storm with fire all around me because the enemy shot a dart and another one. And, another, and what I'm saying is that you have to resist doubt by resisting darts. It is constant thoughts. In fact, the buffeting is the thoughts, not the situation, the thoughts. Let me ask you a very theological just question. Was it Peter's, was it the wind and the waves that made Peter doubt? Or was it his doubt that made him doubt? Was it the fact that it was Jesus or the fact that they hadn't recognized what was happening? Was it the buffeting? My point is, if you don't resist the darts of doubt, yeah. listen, it will lead to fear. Yeah. And courage is the opposite of fear. Because doubts, seeds of doubt, reap harvest of fear. We don't think we're afraid because we're just battling doubts. But the seeds of doubt reap harvest of fear. Yeah. And here's what you have to understand. Fear is more than a feeling. Yeah. 
fear is a spirit. He said to them, take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. Paul said, be of good, be of good courage, don't be afraid. In other words, if I'm going to get courage and take it, I got to fight the feet, oh, the fear and the... And do you realize that some of you have been fighting against the wind? You've been fighting against the waves. You've been fighting in the natural. But listen, as a believer, the only fight we're ever called to fight is the fight of faith. I'm not even fighting my spouse in my marital storm. I'm fighting the enemy who's trying to divide us in the midst of this storm. I'm not fighting the, 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 I'm not fighting the church people. No, I'm fighting the enemy who's trying to divide us. I'm not fighting the economy or the people at my job or the racism or the sexism or the classism or the political. I'm fighting the spirits of evil arrayed against me, and I'm fighting the good fight. What kind of good fight is that? A good one's a fixed one. A good one's the one that if you just fight, you win. Because this fight has already been won. What I'm saying is that you don't have to fight anything else if you just keep your faith. The, this good fight of faith is already fixed because Jesus on the cross has won the fight for you. You got to resist doubt. Because if not, you can be overtaken by a spirit of fear. And let's make it real plain. I, I don't want to make it overly spiritual because me, just like you, have been in a moment where you began, it just started with a, a, a thought. Like, yeah, man, this season's tough. Another person did that? And then all of a sudden, another dart comes, and another, and before long, you're sitting in your cubicle, you're sitting at your, at your desk, and you are literally overtaken with fear and anxiety and, and your, your, st your hands start to sweat, your, your, eye, your, your heart starts to, and you're like, am I having a panic attack? Like, what is this? I mean, I don't even know. Or you, you start to be like, oh my God, I, need to, I just need to get some air, or I just need a moment. And, and what you don't realize is that, is that didn't just start as fear, it entered as doubts, and fear overtook you because fear is more than a feeling, it's a spirit. And if we can be honest in church, it is very easy, I don't care how long you've been saved, for fear to overtake you. And here's what I'm saying. If you don't go take your courage, the storm will take your faith. And in taking your faith, it takes your rest. You got to fight doubt and fear. And with fighting doubt, listen to me, you have to fight, number two, pout. Pastor, grown men ain't supposed to talk about pout. I don't even use the word pout. What do you say to your homeboy like, hey man, stop pouting? <laughs> no, but as believers, I understand the tendency is for us in the storm to begin to pout, to begin to complain, to begin to have legit, in our minds legitimate reason to tell God why this shouldn't be. Why this, Lord, I don't deserve this. Lord, how did this happen? Lord, look at them. It didn't happen to them. They don't even live right, God, and it's not happening to them. No one's ever thought these thoughts. Okay, I'll just talk about me. They, they're shady, God, and their church is growing. They don't need, they, they sleeping with people, and their church is growing. And, and, and people are leading, and I'm trying to live right and love my wife and, and love my kids. That, Lord, that person don't even love you. They just talk about you, Lord. They, don't, they sleep around, and she got a man. Lord, what? Oh, they, Okay. Y'all want to be churchy and lie today. Okay, Lord, this is an altar call for all the liars in the sermon. Lord, touch them in the name of Jesus. They repent because they all lying. You have thought to yourself that they don't deserve that and I don't deserve this. And how did this happen to me? I eat healthy and I still got sick. And Lord, I, I was doing right and it still happened. And Lord, I, don't, I mean, you don't understand, God, that this happened and this happened. And we begin to complain and we begin, listen, to remain. Because when you begin to pout and complain, you refuse to give thanks in all circumstances. And when you refuse to give thanks in all circumstances, you refuse the blessing of an attitude of gratitude. Because listen, it's a garment of praise that you put on to break a spirit of heaviness. Which means, listen, if I can put on a garment of praise to affect the spirit of heaviness, then what if I lived in one? Wouldn't it repel the Spirit from even getting on me? 
But the moment we begin to complain, what do we then invite? There's a reason why the children of Israel, what should have been an 11-day journey, took 40 years and they died in the wilderness because they were complaining in the midst of a difficulty in which their complaining made them fail to realize that they were actually walking in promise. And here's what I'm saying. If you don't be careful, your pout will lead to a bout. A bout. A bout. What are you saying? I'm saying that, listen to the phrase, a spirit of heaviness. Our complaining gives access to the enemy to attack us, not just with emotions, but with a spirit of heaviness. A spirit. Let me make it real plain and take it out of church terms. If we presented Acts 27 to a clinical psychologist, and these men on the ship had not eaten in weeks, nor slept, and had given up all hope, what do you think the diagnosis would be? Depression. A battle with anxiety, and here's what I'm telling you, that if we give room to the enemy too much, don't resist doubt and fear and begin to pout, you actually open yourself up to depression and to anxiety, to eating disorders, and what happens is we start to treat the natural, and then we feel like if we can change the circumstance, we can change our symptoms. And the enemy now has us all off in the natural realm versus the root in the spirit. And what I'm saying is, let me just be transparent. There are some of you here in this room or maybe watching or listening online that you are in a bout with depression. You are in a bout with anxiety. Anxiety attacks aren't an idea for you. They're your reality. And, and, And even suicidal thoughts, they gave up all hope of being saved. Some of them tried to get off the boat altogether. The enemy through a storm can come for you in ways and you can be facing stuff and you know I'm here for you. You know I'm talking to you, the Spirit of God. That, see, let, let's, churches, God is not ignorant of what you really go through. But the fact that God says, take courage, don't be afraid, be of good courage. What he's saying is that he can't command you to come out of something that he didn't empower you to be free from. Paul says, I know you haven't eaten, but let's take some food. Go to sleep. Let's rest because God is going to do what he promised. And what I'm saying is God is the answer. There's nothing wrong. Paul gives a natural approach. Take food. Take sleep. Take the medication if you have to. But don't forget that God is the one who can deliver you from the spirit of heaviness that manifests as depression, that manifests itself as not sleeping, that manifests itself as anxiety attacks, that God has the power to stop the anxiety anxiety attacks now, that I can sleep at night even in the midst of the storm. Why? Because God has the power over the storm. Can I just pray for people right now that are battling? Father, we thank you. God, there are people here who put on their church clothes and their church face and even tried to put on their church shout. But God, beneath it is tears, sleepless nights, nightmares, hallucinations, vain imaginations. God, worries and fears and overtaking. I have to pull off the side of the road because I can't stop thinking of that. Lord, you've been right there in those moments. God, you see You see, God says, for some of you, He sees your fear of crowds, your anxiety among being among people. It took faith for you to get here just today because for some reason the crowd has made you anxious. With every head bowed, every head closed, if that's you, lift your hand. It took a fight for you to get here. Here over here. Here in the back. Here in the back. Here in the back. God says He sees you that he would speak to me to speak to you. He sees you. And that is the devil keeping you from the crowd 
Because in the crowd, God wants to deliver you and free you. The faith in the atmosphere, God is trying to download into you. So God, we rebuke the anxiety of being among people. We rebuke the anxiety of crowds. We rebuke the anxiety that's come from past trauma and abuse and fear and molestation and and just manipulation. God, we rebuke that. We rebuke the spirit of heaviness. God, you said you didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind that we have the mind of Christ. So God, we break the chains of depression and oppression and mental disease and mental disorder. God, you said that if we seek your face. We cannot be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and petition and thanksgiving. And then, God, peace would overwhelm us. It would guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So, God, we thank you for no more sleepless nights. We thank you that we can eat again. Our appetite is coming back, that we're not going to have to pull ourselves out of the bed. We bind that lingering slumber and that slump That feeling like they don't have enough, we bind it in the name of Jesus. We lose, lose freedom, peace. God, I speak calm, speak joy, oil of gladness. Yeah, God, for those of us who are even mourning, and are mourning when we didn't see the morning by morning new mercies, God, we started to slip into a bout of depression and grief. God, thank you that you would infuse them with hope. In Jesus' name, we all sit together. Come on, anybody, you received that prayer, you received that freedom, come on. Amen. Let me finish really quickly because if you're not careful, your bout and your doubt will lead you to depart. Verse 20 said that we gave up finally, finally gave up, we finally gave up when the storm continued raging, we finally gave up, which means they were fighting at one point. They were resisting, but they finally gave up all hope of being saved. What do you depart, pastor? We gotta be careful, because if you don't resist, the enemy, listen to me, will make you depart your faith in this season. Your faith in this season, which means the personal faith you have that God would deliver you, that you can get out of the storm, the enemy will rob you of that faith. And listen to me, if he robs you of the faith, he robs you of your victory. He can't take your victory unless he takes your faith because your victory is guaranteed. Don't throw away your faith. Hebrews says, let us not throw away our confidence. Anybody in the room today, don't throw your faith away. Your personal faith in that God will answer your prayer. He will deliver you. He will do what He promised. Don't throw your faith away through discouragement. Discouragement is on the path to faith departure. A faith departure starts with a a season of discouragement. Discouragement is the runway to you departing your faith. You stay discouraged too long, you will depart your faith. I hear David say, I encourage myself in the Lord. I strengthen myself in the Lord. And then if you're not careful, you'll be tempted, and many of you in this room, may not be all of you, but there's a few of you in every service, I know it, if you have been tempted to depart the faith altogether. Not just that God wouldn't do it in this season, but that you start to doubt and wonder and depart if God is even real. Does He even exist? And I wish there were enough mature church folk in the room who walked with God long enough to know that you can be, you can be walking with God for 20 years and go through something and this thought cross your mind that says, I don't know if this whole, maybe I'm believing a lot. Maybe, I mean, maybe, you know what, where did dinosaurs come from? I mean, what, was it really seven days? Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, did Jesus really? And, th- and then listen, what the devil does is because that, dark comes in your mind, and you let it sit for a second, it starts to kind of get a flame, a little flame in there, and then the devil says, well, if you were really a believer, how could you think that? If you really believe God was good, I thought you just got done saying amen, God is good, and now, see, because the season, listen, what the season is really after is your belief in God. I've, I've walked with people through a span of nine months 
Father lost to a brain tumor. Father dies of a brain tumor unexpectedly. Father-in-law dies of cancer. All in nine months, husband diagnosed with a, the rarest form of leukemia in the world, given 18 to 21 months to live. And while all that was happening, I had a, the, the person had a baby die while the other two babies of triplets were in the NICU. And they went from believing God to, is there a God? And I mean, I know there's love in the world, so there must be love and light, and God is everywhere. I guess if there is one, He must be everywhere because Jesus didn't answer my prayer. And what I'm telling you is the enemy will take a season of storms to make you think that it's an eternity without God and that there is no God and that He's not really there for you and He doesn't really love you and He's not going to provide for you. And there are some of you in this room, just like these men, they didn't just give up hope, they gave up all hope. You are at a point where you came in here questioning. You, some of you, I can hear your thoughts. You said, I'm going to go up there. And I'm going to see, God, if you're really real, you've got to speak to me today. You're listening on YouTube, YouTube, not just the app. You're listening on YouTube. I speak prophetically to you right now. Steve, I'm talking to you. You asked, Steve, you asked if God was real. Well, here God is telling you, Steve, on YouTube. I don't know what year it is you watched this, but you asked God, if you're real, speak to me. So, Steve, God says he's answering your prayer by name. Steve, God loves you and has a plan for you. And what you've been through, the enemy tried to make you doubt God. Steve, you used to believe in God. In fact, you used to serve God, Steve. But you doubt him now and you stop serving him and the enemy robs you of your faith. But the enemy sent the storm to make you depart your faith. But listen to me prophetically, as of this moment and this YouTube clip, you are, your faith is going to be deepened in a way like never before. And some of you, you say, well, my name's not Steve, but the very word spoken was the very word you needed. And you have to grab hold of that and say, God, you, you know what? You really are real. You really are in this thing. You know what, God? You, I'm not, I'm, no, I'm not going to give up my faith because you can't give up the faith because God is real. And no storm, no devil, no doubt, no ideology, no identity issue, no scientific de de depiction or study can make, the Bible says that only a fool says in his heart there is no God, and that's not God trying to put you down. It's God trying to tell you that the wisdom of the world is foolishness unto him, that even though it doesn't make sense in the natural, if you trust God in the spirit, he'll make a way for you. And some of you, the way he gets us to begin to depart, you say, oh, I'm not departing the faith, pastor, I still believe, but what you depart is you depart the faith family. And the Bible says in Romans, Revelation 12, 2, that we, 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 say we, say we, overcome by the blood of the Lamb. That's Jesus. So if you depart Jesus and God, then you depart. There, there is no reason for living. There, there, you might as well give up all hope. But if I can believe in the blood of the Lamb who shed His blood because He loves and dies for me, I can overcome. And we overcome by the, the word of our. It's a plural statement, which means true overcoming happens in the sake of the faith family. And when you begin to depart the family, you begin to depart the faith. And you can act like you can be a believer by yourself. But I would dare you to tell me your faith is stronger in isolation than it is in community. Because no, no, one, said, no one wakes up and says, I'm departing the faith family. The devil sends a, doubt, a dart of doubt that says, they don't see you. Nobody knows what you're going through. That church got big. They don't even, you serve, but they don't even serve you anymore. Don't nobody check, didn't nobody check on you. Are you, I mean, really? Do you really matter up there? Does pastor really care? He doesn't even know my name. Yeah, people, people, all the people, no one even said hi to me. And literally, you come 
but you come closed off. And you come sit down and then you leave. You come serve, but you don't engage. You walk out and so you did your duty, but there was no... Because inwardly we start to take steps of departure from the family that can provide us the strength we need in the storm. Do you know why the men in the Bible fled from Goliath on day 40 but stood there on day one? Because the enemy's tactic is isolation. The Goliath called out a man. And the enemy wants to call you out by yourself to destroy you. But they didn't depart in one moment. The first day, they, they just were afraid. But day 40, after the same, the Bible says, usual defiance, he said the same thing. And he said it at the same time. You know those lies of the devil, but you find yourself not being able to resist them any longer. Because it's a spirit of fear. And the longer you let fear stay, the more you'll be afraid. But it's in the family that we can say, you know what? We can do this together. Why did even the men of Israel agree to Goliath's terms? Why do we let the devil set the terms of the battle? What if another dude was like, you know what? That's what he said, but the five of us, we're going we to jump him. What I'm saying is that you need to, when you feel like going to church the least, is the time you need to go the most. And when you feel the most isolated is the time when you need to be like, hi, what's your name? How are you? And you need to begin because it's our testimony where somebody else, because you can be in a test and you don't have much moaning to give. All you got is moaning and groaning. And, and, and then somebody else can say, girl, you going through a marriage struggle? Let me tell you what we went through. And you could be like, oh my God, y'all are elders. You went through that too? Yeah, because God can redeem you. He can restore you. And I've, I've slept on a couch in another room. I got a hotel room. I cussed them out. And now now we're madly in love because it's grace, it's sufficient, and you would have left and be. You need somebody else's testimony. And listen, somebody else needs yours. Some of you feel like nobody hears me, no one sees me, there's no community, everyone's overlooked me. And let me give you a word in this season, some of you are not gonna get community to come to you. Because God is trying to teach you in this season that you've been the one that always needs. But there is a fulfillment in Him in which you begin to be the one who gives. And it's in your giving because He who refreshes others is in Himself refreshed. See, there's somebody in this room right now who walked in like I was saying. Nobody knows and they think nobody cares. And you're over there like, see, the people just stop caring about me. And maybe... If you go find the person who was you, you'll find that not only will God encourage you as you encourage them, but that you'll be reminded of your own testimony. And Jeff said it, all you need is a memory. All I need is a memory. And what I'm saying is that some of us, God is trying to elevate us to where we've always thought we needed to be poured into. And you do, but there are seasons when you need to pour out even though you feel like you have nothing to give. I, let me make it plain. I've been in places where I've been wanting to call like brothers in the faith that, I, that other pastors and friends that I have to encourage me through difficulty, even in the last few weeks. And the one that I like to call the most who gives the best counsel, master's degree, Christian counselor and spirit led, he, he, he can't talk to me because his mom's on hospice getting ready to pass away, see to Jesus. So I didn't know. I called him looking for help. And he's like, man, I'm so glad you called. On the way to see mom, she, they, they gave her like the week to live. So immediately, not only did my problem get put in perspective, I had to tap in and be like, you know what, Lord, you have been good, good God. Be with my friend. And God, and I began to encourage him. And by the time I got done encouraging him, I was pretty daggone encouraged. I was like, woo, that was good. I gave myself an offering. But at first I was salty because he couldn't be there for me. And then I felt guilty for being salty when his mom's sick. And my pro oh, I'm just, am I the only person that's real in the building? I'm tired of y'all judging me like I'm not spiritual. I'm, 
at least I privately was salty. Some of y'all are like, you just went ahead and told him your problem, even though, because you bought it. You... Don't depart. Listen, th- this is a plug on purpose. You should have got one of these in the bulletin. Some of you are like, I don't even get the bulletin. I know what it says. No, it changes, so you need to get it. But we are doing, listen, men's and women's nights every month for the rest of the fall. This is your chance to get in community. We're going to come together. It's not going to be a service. We're going to have very intimate, private worship, not lights and smoke. We're going to w- teach you how to worship God even when all this stuff ain't going on because you don't get to take this home on Thursday night. So on Thursday night when the enemy comes in, you better know how to put on a little YouTube or bootleg that album you, you bootlegged and didn't buy, and you just begin to worship God in your, in your throne room. And then we're going to share a brief word with you, and then you're going to get into a small group where you can talk about and be honest about your struggles, and somebody else needs your story. And I would say you need to share it. So men's and women's nights... Every, every, every time this fall. And then after that, you are free to stay in dudes. I got basketball courts for y'all. I got games and dominoes. Ladies, y'all don't need much to fellowship, so praise the Lord. Dudes, we need an activity. <laughs> or else another brother be like, yeah, I'm out, man, I'm out. <laughs> we will argue over, the, we will talk all day about sports, but the moment it becomes to come inward, we get private. But do what you really need for deliverance is another brother. And the weight, I prophesied to you, dude, the weight's so heavy because you carry it by yourself. But I don't care how strong you are. You start lifting enough weight, you need a spotter. I'm over time, as always. So write these four things. How does Paul tell you to take courage? I just can't tell you to take it and not tell you how. So let me give you this. Let me take, you take it with you to lunch and you go on about your business and I'll preach again. Praise the Lord. How do you do it? How do you take courage? Well, Paul says, he said, keep up your courage. In verse 23, last night an angel of God, whose I am, an angel of God, Jesus said, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Take courage, it is I. In other words, the first way to take courage, listen, is to know who God is. Know who God is. And some of you are like, I know who God is. No, you need to not know who God was or who he will be. You need to know who he is right now. That God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That He's not a a will be, maybe over there, God, or a was over there. He's an ever present right now in my moment, in my situation, God. And listen, maybe either Jesus was really proper in English, or the disciples really wanted to be formal, or maybe He said, It is I, because He was trying to jog their memory about who the I am is. It is I. Jesus spent the book of John revealing the I am, the seven I am's. I am the bread of life. I am the I am. I am. I am. Maybe he said it is I because now in the midst of the storm, you need to remember it's not just some random religious Jesus walking with me. It is literally Jehovah, the I am that I am, El Shaddai, the many-breasted, all-sufficient one, the I am that I am, that there's an I am reminder that you know what? I'm going through a financial storm, but I forgot that Jehovah He, he's not just any Jehovah. He, he's Jehovah that provides for my needs. I, I'm going through a storm of sickness. Wait a minute. I forgot that he is Jehovah Rapha, my healer. I, I'm going through a storm of where I don't know what to do, but I forgot that he's Jehovah Rohi, my shepherd, which means he leads. I feel like preaching because you forgot who he was. He says he's God. He's not just any God, he's the I am God, which means he's I am whatever you need me to be. But no, pastor, you don't know my storm. I don't, but I know he's Jehovah Shalom. Pastor, you don't know how they're attacking me. You don't know the enemy, but he's Jehovah Nisi, my victory. Pastor, I don't know all them words. I don't know. I'm not that. I'm not, I don't know all that. Well, let me give you a good reminder. Number one, who God is? He's love. God is love, which means the doubt many of you had, and I'll go, is that some of you think that God doesn't love you enough to be there for you. But the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4 that God is love, which means he is love, which means he can't not be himself. Which means no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, 
he can't disown himself, which means he can't disown you. You don't have to doubt God's love for you because he is love. Number two, the Bible says God's good, which means this situation ain't good, and God knows it don't feel good. It feels like I'm going to die through this thing. It feels like hell, and it feels like I'm ready to give up. But God, you're good, which means this may not feel good. It may not be good, but God, you are certainly working this for my good. Because if God is good, all he does is good stuff. And I prophesy, if it ain't good, it ain't over. Tell somebody, if it ain't good, it ain't over. If it ain't good, it's not over. Listen, when you watch your favorite show, if you stopped watching on episode seven of season two, you wouldn't realize that the story doesn't end in the episode of that season. That the author has already planned out all the writing. And listen to me, if they kill off the main character in season, seven, in season two, episode seven, they can't renew the season. What I'm saying is, why would God write you out of the story when we in the middle of the season? Don't you throw in the towel in the middle of the season because you stopped reading on one chapter. This is not the period of your story. This is a comma. Take courage, take courage. He said, whose I am? God, whose I am? It's not enough to know who God is. You better know who God is. He, I'm his son. I'm his daughter, which means there's no way a good, loving father is going to let me drown in the storm. You're his beloved daughter and son, which means it don't matter what I did. It doesn't matter how I got here, that he'll still rescue me out of the storm. They said, the God whom I serve, because there is a confidence that comes from status. It's not based on what you do, but you and I both know, you call a friend who you ain't talked to in a while and you need some money, there's a way you ask. You're not really sure. But if you walking and talking, you're just your best friend, they'll offer money before you even ask. And there's a different confidence I go to God with prayer when I know he's my friend, when I know I'm serving him. And what's more is if I'm serving him, he needs me in this season because if he loses me, who's going to do that? Let me just say it this way. There's, there's purpose in your, there's peace in your purpose. There's protection in your purpose. One of the reasons you better get on purpose, you better get in here, get serving, get, get, get giving, get doing, is you don't, I told somebody the other day, they're talking about their job shifting. I said, girl, your job, you ain't got to worry a day about your job because God going to always take care of you because you're so busy taking care of everybody's people, you carrying all these folk in the spirit. God ain't got time for you to be worried about what you're going to eat or wear because he, he got you feeding people spiritually. And some of us, we, we get a little nervous because we ain't feeding nobody, so we don't know if God's going to provide any more food. Okay. And, and lastly, and we'll go, we'll go, we'll go. I promise we'll go, we'll go. Paul said, listen, all of you, here's what's going to happen. Let me, I'll just make, make sure you see it in the Word. Paul says, don't be afraid. The, the angel said, don't be afraid, Paul. Listen, you must stand trial before Caesar, which means, Paul, you got a purpose. So this storm ain't stopping your purpose. You may think it can stop you, but it can't stop you because you're walking in purpose. And when I'm walking in purpose, what my, one of my overseers, Bishop Mott, uh, I consider my pastor, Bishop Mott, tells me all the time, son, I'm not worried about that because as long as I'm walking in purpose, I'm protected. And there's a confidence, almost a swagger that he carries that no matter what he faces, he, he knows he's walking in purpose in that moment, in that day. And if he's in purpose, then the devil can't take him out. And then lastly, he says, listen... <laughs> He says, he said, I'm going to stand trial before Caesar, and I've graciously given you and all the lives who sail with you, which is prophetic that not just is God going to deliver you, but he's going to deliver everybody connected to you. Yeah. That if you, if you throw in your faith in this storm, if Paul gets off the boat, everybody on the boat 
goes down. If you give up, mama, your kids have to fight this. You, you, God will deliver you and everybody connected to you. God doesn't just deliver by himself. He delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abed. He didn't just deliver that. He, he delivers. He didn't just deliver Peter. He touched all the disciples. But Peter walked on the water, but everybody was safe. And here's why. Here's why. Here's why. We'll go. So keep up your courage, Nikao, verse 25. Paul says, and I say, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. In other words, God will do what he said. And some of us, the storm has made us forget what we heard. Because Jesus said, take courage, it is I don't be afraid. So if God commands me or gave me a promise, even a command, God can't be a good God who loves me and command me to do something that he hasn't empowered me by his grace to do. In other words, you forgot your promise. Jesus was the one who sent the disciples to the other side, which means he already gave them a word that you're going to the other side. He said to Paul, you go stand before Caesar. So if I have a promise, but I don't have the manifestation, I have to remember the manifest. See, when I was in high school, my first job, I think it was, it was abuse, but I worked at a trophy warehouse on Graham Street in Charlotte, and I, I made less than minimum wage with no air condition, and we pulled parts for trophies so, like, if you got a trophy, I was the one who would make all, get all the parts and ship it to the people who make your trophy, and then I have to load boxes all day on UPS trucks in the middle of the summer heat, okay? What would happen is the printer would go off, and there would be a purchase manifest. It was the order form, and the moment that form came in, one of us would tear it, and we immediately get a box and go putting all the things ordered into the box to pack it to put it on the truck to ship it. But what if the customer didn't believe that behind the scenes, the purchase manifest that she put in place was being shipped and she ordered another one? What I'm saying is that the moment you heard God speak, there was a purchase order placed in heaven and the angels went to work. Paul had an angel working. Peter was supernaturally helped to walk on that water. Stuff went to work behind the scenes that you can't see. And your, your, your deliverance is on the delivery truck. And some of us are about three minutes, two, two Tuesdays away from giving up all hope when your breakthrough, your deliverance is on the truck, but because you didn't see it manifest yet, you thought there was no, that it hadn't been heard, there was no manifest place. What I'm saying is that between the promise and my possession, there's a process. But Paul says no matter what the process is, God's going to do what he promised. So until he stands before Caesar, it don't matter what happens because I'm going to stand before him. Until they get to the other side, it don't matter how many wind and waves hit us, we're going to get to the other side. If God said in his word already that he'd healed you, then I don't care how long you have to battle that symptom or that disease or that diagnosis, he's going to heal you. If God said he would provide for you, it doesn't matter if they lay folks off. He'll provide for you other ways or he'll give you a new job altogether that's better with better benefits and more time off. If God said, I'm going to restore this situation, then it may get worse because sometimes in restoration, you have to sand off the other paint to get new paint, and which means if I'm in the, pro it doesn't matter what the process, as long as I remember the promise, because listen, God is not a man that he should lie. The Bible says, if God speaks, Numbers 23, 19. Does he not act? Does God promise and not fulfill? Church, you're going to go to the other side. Storms can come. It may get worse this week, but that has nothing to do with your promise. In fact, I didn't even want to preach it, but I'll throw it out because I think y'all are mature enough to handle it. But after Paul says, it'll happen just as, I, just as God promised to you. <laughs> he 
says. Oh, I don't even want to say it, God. I honestly didn't want to read it. Verse 26. After he said, God's going to do what he told us. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Which means we still may have some problems. But no matter what I face between my promise and my possession, well, God's going to do what he said. Because I can't live by what I see. I have to live by what he said. Bow your head, let's pray. Father, I thank you that you're a real God. God, some of us are in not just tough days, but God, we're in tough seasons. And God, God, some of it we know you're a part of. And you're working it for our good, but God, it's hard. And God, for some of those moments, we thought about giving up, throwing in the towel in this season. But God, thank you for giving us the strength to believe you, to take courage, to resist doubt and rest in your love. God, I bind suicidal spirits right now. That person who was wavering if life is even worth it because it's too hard. Those thoughts are not your thoughts. They are not from God. Those are the devil trying to get you to take your life and throw in the towel. God, silence those voices right now by your spirit. Satan, the Lord rebuke you in the name of Jesus. We plead the blood over that person's mind. God, we loose thoughts of good. How precious are your thoughts towards them. God, I pray that you download your thoughts toward those people beyond the lies. God, for those of us who are in a storm that seems like it's just not ceasing, but the waves are buffeting, I pray for supernatural courage to trust you, to rest in your love. God, do what only your spirit can do beyond my words. God, I pray that they'd walk out of here with their backs straightened, shoulders up, their head held high. And that weight they've been carrying, God, take that weight. New strength. Father, you said for those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. God, they shall mount up on wings like eagles. Lord, we're eagles, which means we use the storm to fly higher. So give us an eagle spirit, an eagle anointing. Hey God, where we see the storm, but we fly above it. Where it doesn't take us down, it elevates us. And with every head bowed, every eye closed, I don't want to embarrass you, but I do want to pray for you. There's some of you who were, or maybe are, doubting the faith. Christianity, I don't know of God at all, I'm not sure. Maybe you just are a self-proclaimed atheist, or even an agnostic, or maybe you don't even know those terms, but you're just not sure. I want to say a prayer for you. Father, I pray that you would draw them with your love back to you. God, right in this moment, God, beyond words, give them an experience and an encounter with you that's not emotion, that God is the tangible presence of God. Whisper to their hearts. Let them leave here and have dreams and visions, God, even as angels appeared to Paul, God, show up in the bathroom if you have to. God, show them how real and alive you are. I thank you for my friend Steve. I thank you for everybody like Steve or every sister like him, or like Su Susan's of the world, the female, whoever it is, God, you know them. And God, for all of us, bind those doubts and we'll trust in you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. We all said together.